All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. This is the last session of the day, or last round of sessions of the day before we have our lightning rounds and, and raffle downstairs. So, um, is everyone having a good time at Drupal Camp? Learning a lot? Good deal. All right. So my name is Lisa Ridley, I'm with Plan Left, and I'm going to talk to you about Figma today. Now, the original title of this um, session was Useful Plugins, UI Kits, and Design Systems to Supercharge Your Design Process, but Figma decided to throw a kink in the works by introducing a whole bunch of new feature sets back in, at Config 2023 last month. And many of the plugins and, and design systems that I was going to talk about now need to be reworked in order to incorporate some of the new features that Figma has incorporated. And some of those plugins have been rendered really kind of irrelevant at this point because of the feature sets that Figma has built in. So we're going to talk about some of the new features that Figma introduced um, that make um, the, de the design system, the online design system uh, or design tool, I'm not gonna call it a system, I'm gonna call it a tool, um, that will make, that make the tool a lot more effective. So um, their focus for 2023, we'll talk about in just a few minutes in terms of the tooling, it's actually very relevant for, for folks in the room that have developer experience. So, all right, a little bit about me. I'm a product manager and tech team lead for Plan Left, um, which is a digital agency out of um, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I have 16 years of web development experience, um, an additional 30 years of project management experience total. Um, prior to being in web development, I, was, I had another career. Um, I'm an Acquia certified developer. I've not gotten a D10, D9, D10 certification. I am certified on D7. Um, I am a certified Scrum Master and a certified uh, Scrum Product Owner, and also I'm certified in Human Centered Design. I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I am a smack talking SEC football fanatic and a Tennessee Volunteers fan. Um, I'm also a NASCAR fanatic, and this is my little supervisor, Sassy Bridges, who hangs out in my office with me while I work from home. All right, so what is Figma? Any, is anyone in here um, know what Figma is? Most, okay, about, about half, okay. So Figma is, um, if, you're, um, if you've never used it before, Figma is the leading online collaborative design tool for building meaningful products. And that's actually off of their, their website. Uh, Figma is a tool that was publicly released for, uh, use, by, for uh, use by businesses and, and designers um, in September of 2016. It had been in a secret beta for almost two years prior to that. It was built by Dylan Field and Evan Wallace. Both of them were uh, students at Brown University. One of them uh, majored in graphics design. The other one was a software engineer. Um, and they, they both had teaching assistants and fellowships at Brown University. Their original objective in starting on uh, building this thing that they built um, was to enable anyone to be creative by creating free, simple, and creative tools in a browser. <clears throat> and their focus was making sure that it could be done in a browser. It was a tool that would work in the browser so that it would enable people to be able to collaborate through the internet. Figma today, uh, their first product conference was held in 2020. So that was the first time they had their community con. Um, with, and they had approximately 800 attendees. At the time, they had an estimated 200,000 subscribers to their platform. In June of 2023, they had their next in-person conference. They had over 8,000 people attend Config 2023 in San Francisco in person. Another 200,000 people attended virtually um, at 55, and there were 55 uh, different watch parties in 55 different countries that um, that were had uh, also set up uh, connectivity issues in at or connectivity places at various locations around and there were multiple people that attended through those watch parties um, currently today um, Figma has an estimated uh, subscriber base of 4 million um, now that's their subscriber base. Not all of them are paying subscribers. Some of them subscribe to the free plan, uh, but they do have 4 million subscribers. In September of 2022, Adobe entered into an agreement to acquire Figma for $20 billion. Um, and that is primarily due to the 
in part to the rapid growth and adoption that this platform has undergone and the fact that it has it is a tool that has brought something new and different, a bit disruptive, but positively disrupted to the design space. So what can you do with Figma? Well, you can create digital designs, you can build digital prototypes, you can create and share design systems, you can build digital products faster, all of this you can do collaboratively. So you can have multiple people working on a project online. That project can be shared and distributed online with other people that are interested parties. So if you've got stakeholders, clients you need to share work product with, all of that can be done through the internet. So it, at Config 2023, Figma introduced a bunch of new features uh, for their product. Um, and these features all really focused on the design to developer transition of, de of design products. So going from the, the design state over to the build state. Um, and one of the long awaited features that was introduced at Config 2023 that um, the design uh, groups, the design users of Figma had been asking for for years um, was introduced sort of but actually in a better format um, designers have been asking for design tokens for a couple of years um, so that they can have some reusable components now the the limitation with a token is it's an immutable object so it's something that once you set it you don't really change it so if you use it in multiple places you use it in multiple places as it is set what actually got introduced instead of tokens was variables. So variables can have assigned values that can be modified easily and the modification of those variables will populate through what, wherever they, those variables are being used. If you change the values, they will populate through. So there are lots and lots of uses for these in Figma today and it, this is actually still emerging. They're working on new feature sets that will be introduced later this year. So a little bit of, um, I'm going to play a video that is a, a subset of an introduction to variables uh, in Figma. Then this was, um, this is part of a presentation that was at Config 2023. By definition, a variable is something that can vary in value or take on multiple values. Variables in Figma store reusable values like color values and numbers, that can be applied to all kinds of design properties and even prototypes. Sound similar to styles? Well, not quite. Because of their dynamic nature, variables allow designs to change when used in different contexts. For example, you can switch your designs between light and dark modes, instantly change all the strings of a modal to a different language, or have padding values change when designing for a different device size. A variable's values can also reference other variables, making updating design systems a breeze. If you have coding experience, you may be familiar with the concept of variables already. If not, don't worry, no coding knowledge is needed. In so, variables instead of design tokens, much, much more useful uh, type of implementation and was loudly applauded at Config 2023. I am actually playing with variables now in Figma and finding all sorts of uses for them, as well as they are part of other feature sets that were introduced at Config 2023 as well. So you may have seen mention of, of something that's called modes which is related to the to variables in the way that they're introduced. And what modes allows you to do is build a, a multi-value variable table that you can then um, use in different contexts. So you heard mentioned in the previous video talking about light and dark mode, being able to um, be able to set a mode that where you can change the language of labels that are in a, um, a design feature. Um, another use case might be going from mobile to tablet to desktop that you could set that as, as a variable, although there's actually a, a particular, a potentially better way to, to actually make that transition, which we'll also talk about. Um, but variables that the modes are 
an interesting concept um, and actually drastically shortens your design process because if you can set modes, then you can do your designs within one frame and that frame just can have its mode context switched and you will be able to instantly see what the um, outcome of switching that mode is. So the outcome of going from having a component displayed in English to having a component displayed in Japanese to having a component displayed in German. Um, you can also switch between light and dark mode. So if you, you're building dark mode into your themes, you can see it at just a, a click of, literal click of a switch. Um, going from light mode to dark mode if you've defined your color schemes for that. So um, this actually comes into play when you're prototyping from your, from your design elements. We want to be able to quickly switch world piece designs between light and dark modes. But how? This is where modes and variables come in. Modes allow designs to change when used in different contexts. For example, string variables can be used for contexts like localizing language, number variables can account for spatial changes across different device sizes, and Boolean variables can toggle layer visibility to show a warning if a product is almost sold out. Let's go back to our tokens collection to set up light and dark modes using color variables. Click the plus button in the column header. Figma duplicated colors from the first mode column to the new one. The first column already accounts for our light mode. Let's rename it to light. The second column will account for our dark mode, so let's rename it to dark. Then choose different variables from our primitives collection to define them. All our hard work is about to pay off. Select the frame for the watermelon listing and go to the layer section in the right sidebar. Since the frame has layers with variables applied, the change variable mode button appears. Let's click it, open tokens, and select dark. The entire frame changed to the values we set for dark mode. But wait, what was that auto option in the dropdown? Auto means an object's mode is based on its parent's mode. So if we set this object's mode to auto and drag it between a frame with light mode and a frame with dark mode, it changes according to the context. If the parent has no mode, then the object defaults to the first mode of the variables collection. In this... Oops, sorry. So that was a bit of a game changer. Um, because prior to introducing the modes, if you wanted to design out light mode and dark mode, you had to actually design two different frames. So you, and typically what a designer would do would be to design the first frame in light mode and then copy it over and then manually go in and change all of the color options, the spacing options. Uh, if it was a language, they would have to, to insert strings that were, uh, <clears throat> they would have to insert strings that were in a different language, but those were all hard-coded, and so that was very labor-intensive. So what this did is it sped up. I think I saw some interviews, uh, some of the shorts that were on uh, where they had interviewed designers in the hallway uh, between sessions, and they put shorts up on, on YouTube, uh, that, that designers were estimating that that would reduce the level of effort of creating designs on uh, some of their digital product teams by as much as 30%. So that was a huge time saver. Um, it also comes into play extremely, uh, it, it's, it has a huge impact on uh, being able to prototype uh, so that you can do use, user testing uh, before you actually start building a product. Um, you can do interactive prototypes in Figma. Um, and um, so it you know, comes into play there. So there's just lots of things that inter the introduction of variables and modes has opened up in, in the ability for designers to iterate faster over components, but this also comes into play when we start uh, talking about development. So another, um, another feature that Figma has built into it, and I think this was introduced in 2021, was a feature that they call auto layout, <clears throat> which basically would allow you to apply some of the aspects of flex to a frame. So you could have things um, position side by side or, or, or position in columns or position in rows. Um, the one thing that it, it was a bit limited, uh, it did a lot of, of really neat um, 
had a lot of really neat features and also reduced um, level of effort on creating designs. But some of the things that it was missing is that it did not have the ability to wrap. Um, so if you were resizing a frame to see what the impact was and your intention was when you hit a certain break point for things to shift down to, low, to a lower row, that was not an option uh, prior to, to Config 2023. What a designer would typically do would be to build a frame with a different break point and reposition the items on the page. So with, um, with some of the auto layout enhancements, especially the wrapping, you no longer have to do that. Um, the other thing that was built in using variables um, was support for setting minimum and maximum widths on objects. So there again, you can actually make your uh, layout behave more the way that we would expect a layout that's programmed with flex uh, to dis the way that it behaves on the screen to actually behave that way in the design process as well. Um, so here's a bit on the auto layout. Components. Hello everyone. Today we're diving into one of Figma's latest features, wrapping auto layout objects and setting minimum and maximum widths and heights. These new features are a part of several impactful updates released by Figma yesterday, all aimed at enhancing our design workflow. We'll be delving into each update in a series of videos, so subscribe to stay in the loop. Without further ado, let's jump into the Figma file. Before the release of this update, if we wanted to create a layout with two rows containing four cards, we had to go through a rather complex process. We had to create three auto layouts in total. The first one was a main auto layout that acted as a container, and inside it, we had two nested auto layouts. This approach gave us the desired layout, but it wasn't exactly a seamless process. It required managing multiple layers of auto layouts and any changes needed to be carefully propagated through this structure. However, with the introduction of auto layout wrapping, this has changed drastically for the better. We can now achieve the same result with just one auto layout. By selecting the wrap option, our four cards automatically arrange themselves into two neat rows within a single auto layout frame. This not only simplifies the design process, but also makes managing and modifying our designs much more efficient and intuitive. Another new feature is the support for minimum and maximum widths and heights. This lets us define a minimum and maximum values for our layers, adding an extra level of precision to your designs. Let's look at this in action. We have four cards here with auto layout applied. We can change the horizontal resizing property of the auto layout to hug contents and select all cards inside it and change the same property to fill container. Now we can set the minimum width for each card. For example, 374 pixels. Now, as I resize the frame, the cards are getting wider, but once they go below 374 pixels, the last card will wrap to the next line. This allows the objects to flow in multiple rows and columns within the frame, wrapping to the next line once the minimum width of the cards is reached. Now, let's experiment with setting a maximum width for the auto layout frame. Let's set it to 2010 pixels. Notice that no matter how much I try to drag, the frame refuses to stretch beyond the 2010 pixel limit. Let's add another layer of complexity by nesting these cards inside another auto layout frame. Currently, the cards are stretching beyond our desired limit, but by setting a maximum width for the nested frame, we ensure that the cards do not extend past a width of 2000 pixels. This feature can prove immensely helpful in web design where setting a maximum width for your content is essential to maintain the layout even on larger screen sizes. That concludes our guide on Figma's auto layout updates. But wait, there's a lot more to come. We're crafting a whole series of videos, each one focused on a new exciting update. Subscribe to our channel to be the first to master these new features and enhance your design skills. See you in the next video. There again, trying, trying to get the design tools closer to the developer tools that, that are used to build, actually build websites so that designs out of the box when they're handed off to the developers behave the way that the designers intend for the site to behave as you interact with it so developers are no longer left guessing on, on where to set breakpoints, how to handle stacking of uh, components. Um, all of this will speed up the developer process, but there's more. We already played that. <laughs> so 
prototyping enhancements that, that Figma built in. I don't, has anyone in here ever done a prototype in Figma? You have? Okay. If you heard, um, if you heard of the term pasta page? Okay, yeah, so no more pasta pages. Um, the introduction of variables has significantly simplified the prototyping process um, in Figma and also um, gives you, uh, if the easier it is to prototype, the more, the more likely it is that a designer is going to build a prototype that actually is going to reflect the way that they intend the application to work so, um, and be able to do more user testing up front with the prototype and also up front with data so that you can modify your designs prior to starting the development process, um, which would, is going to make um, the product a higher quality product, but also will speed up development as develop, you don't have to wait until the site is built and you're starting to put content into a site to find out that you needed to make this section of, of the component that you, you designed bigger or you needed to make the titles smaller, um, or you needed to compensate for multi-line titles. Um, so all of that you can, you can um, actually test with the prototyping. Variables are stored values that represent design attributes. With variables, we've introduced two new prototyping actions, set variable and conditional, available on paid plans. The set variable action allows us to change the value of any variable. For example, we might use a number variable to represent the cart total on a checkout page design. We can set variables to new literal values, use expressions to calculate new values with operations, and even reference other variables in our new values. The conditional action allows us to use if-else logic in prototypes which means we can check for certain requirements before performing an action. So being able to build conditional logic into your prototypes allows you to have more dynamic and interactive prototypes without having to create those pasta pages in order, in order to have a prototype that goes through all of the potential iterations that you may need to do with a shopping cart, for example. are stored values that represent design attributes. Now, the, one of the big features that was introduced at Config 2023 is a feature called Dev Mode. And Dev Mode is actually, along with variables, is actually one of the, the major features that Figma introduced that made some of the plugins that I was intending to talk about in here obsolete and irrelevant. So um, this is, and a, a note here, dev mode can have its own set of plugins. So not necessarily something a designer would be interested in, but something that a developer would be very, very interested in. Um, so without any more discussion, let's, let's see some of the features of dev mode. Welcome to dev mode, a space in Figma where developers can find what they need to implement designs more efficiently. Features like design to code, section statuses, and plugins ensure designers and developers are always on the same page. With dev mode in Figma, the handoff process is better than ever. I'm a developer on World Peas, an online organic grocery store, and I'm in the process of building our web app. A designer on my team just sent over this Figma file, and I want to make sure our code base reflects the most recent design updates. I'm going to switch over to dev mode to see what we're working with. This section is marked ready for dev, so these frames must be ready for implementation. Let's take a look at the layers in this frame. I can see the names and types of layers in the inspect panel. This frame contains some text, shapes, and components. Hmm. This frame looks a little different from the last time I viewed it. I wonder what changed. Dev mode allows me to compare changes from previous versions to the current version by viewing the frame's history. Now, which version did I see last? I think it was this one. Ah, the background color of this layer changed. By viewing the frame's history, I can see how its styles have been edited. 
I'll make a note to update that in the code base. I need a bit more information about this component. The inspect panel in dev mode displays the styles and assets I need and even includes a component playground where I can try out different component properties without changing the design. Dev mode also provides a box model and generates code for this component. Right now, the generated code is in Swift UI. I'm developing for web, so let me switch it over to CSS. I can see the new color style being used, and the background color is already updated in the generated code. I'll copy this for later. My team is using GitHub for version control on this project. There's a link attached to this component that takes us to its implementation in our code base. With the GitHub integration, I can see exactly which file the component is in, as well as the code associated with it, all without having to leave Figma. That just saved me the trouble of having to look through our repo to find the right component. While I'm here, I'll also go ahead and add a link to the related Asana task so I can track my work easily. I think I'm ready to open VS Code and start updating these frames. Which reminds me, I heard someone mention that Figma now has a VS Code extension. Let's check it out. With Figma for VS Code, I can see which designs are ready for development and get new comment notifications without breaking my flow. No more switching back and forth between the design file and my text editor. From here, I can also view additional dev resources linked to the component. There's the GitHub link we saw earlier. It opens the file in my editor. For components that don't have an existing implementation, the Figma for VS Code extension provides autocomplete suggestions based on our design. This workflow is pretty efficient. I can quickly find what I need from a Figma design file and avoid all the usual context switching during development. I should ask the team if they've had a chance to try out dev mode. First, let me share the updated designs with the rest of the devs since they're working on implementing other frames for the World Keys app. I can send them this link so they get dropped right into dev mode when they open the file. Thanks for exploring dev mode with me today. What other features would you want to see to improve your handoff process? Let us know in the comments below. See you next time. So for the developers in the room, thoughts? All of this is brand new. Well, your, your designers don't need dev mode. Dev mode's not intended for the designers. Dev mode's intended for the developers. My designers are still using PDFs. Uh, no. The, I mean, this, this, the expectation is that the designers would have to use Figma. Where, um, if you don't mind me asking, where, um, what, what are they using to generate the PDFs? InDesign. InDesign. Now they would, they would have to leave InDesign behind. Mm -hmm. I think it, yeah, it sounds like Figma's actually got some more uh, features because I think we're kind of moving towards using that going forward. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing, the one thing I noted on, on the slide is that dev mode can have its own set of plugins. There have actually been some plugins already written for dev mode. Um, you saw some of them utilized there. Uh, Figma actually wrote the the the. Figma for VS Code extension. So that's actually not a plugin, it's an extension to VS Code that then communicates with uh, Figma. You have to configure it just a little bit when you install it. Um, and then, uh, but the plugins, it, the, there's a number of code generation plugins that have been uh, contributed by the community to Figma already. Um, some of the larger enterprise uh, companies that use Figma have contributed um, code generation plugins that generate code that they use on projects. So there's uh, code plugins that generate, uh, you saw SwiftUI, React, Vue. Um, there's uh, 
HTML and CSS. There is um, also uh, some plugins that have been written and contributed uh, that are in beta that uh, generate code for Flutter. Now, is it perfect code? No. Is it a good starting point for a, a, a Flutter developer or a Swift UI developer to take and start without having to spend 30 minutes, you know, either copying and pasting from somewhere else or um, setting down and writing like the basic scaffolding for a component? Absolutely, it's a great starting place. I will tell you that I've used it to generate some code for um, HTML and CSS that uses Tailwind. It's phenomenal how accurate the Tailwind utility classes are in the markup, in the HTML markup that that plugin will generate. Make sure I don't start the video again. Damn it. <laughs> All right, so dev mode uh, and Figma for VS Code are in beta. Um, there are new features that are planned to be added later this year, um, and it will be available for free. Uh, so if you're using the free, uh, the free version of Figma or any of the paid versions, dev mode is available for free for 2023. Um, starting in 2024, for editors, it, it, the way that Figma sells their seat licenses, it's based on the editors. Uh, so uh, someone who just has view only access doesn't you doesn't consume a seat license for your for your subscription to Figma. So editors typically are designers. Um, so dev mode will be available for all editors on paid plans in 2024. For the organization and enterprise plans, and Figma has three levels of paid plans. There's a pro level, which is for individuals. There is a, an organization level, which is for small teams, and then there's an enterprise level, which is for large teams. Um, dev mode seats can be purchased at a reduced price over the full editor seat. So if you had a team of 10 designers and 30 developers, you could buy the full seat licenses for your designers, but your developers, you could buy dev mode seat licenses and the price of those seat licenses is reduced on both the organization and the enterprise plans. I believe a full seat license on the organization plan right now is $45 per seat for editors. And on the enterprise plan, I believe it's $70 per seat. Um, and there's, there are some enhanced features that come with those, with those higher level plans. But you can see that if you had a team of 200, if you were using it across your organization and you had a development department with designers and developers of 300 people, that's going to be a pretty hefty price tag. So being able to give that price break for folks that aren't actually in there creating the designs, but they are consuming the information from the designs, um, then you know, that's, that's a bit of a price break savings. So because I wanted, didn't want to like, leave everyone hanging about UI kits and design systems, I did include some resources in the slides on some UI kits and design systems. Figma has a very active community with a lot of high quality contributed UI design kits or UI kits and design systems that can help you jumpstart your design process. Um, for the first time this year, Apple contributed a UI kit for iOS and iPad OS. Previously, that had been community maintained design kits. So Apple has taken ownership of, of building and contributing the design kits for, for their products. Um, and among resources that you may find that are useful in terms of design kits that are contributed by some of the uh, Figma partners are Salesforce design kits. So if you do any Salesforce plugin development, um, you would be interested in that. There's Amazon design kits for some of Amazon's products. So if you're doing uh, any product development on any of the Amazon platforms, you can get design kits to help with that. Uh, Atlassian, if you're doing plugins for Atlassian, they've contributed a design kit. Asana has contributed a design kit. Um, now, some of the design kits that are contributed that, vary, that have come out of various design firms uh, for the web, uh, there's a number of them. One of my favorites is Untitled UI. It has a free and a paid version, and the free version, uh, and almost all of these design kits are built on the principles of atomic design. So they'll have, you'll have your, your atoms, some of them even have what they call particles, so you, you get, getting even smaller than atoms, um, and then, um, but rolling up into molecules, and then, you know, your components or your organisms, and then, you, you know, even some of them even go, even go so far as to build template pages. So, 
the uh, Untitled UI has two uh, versions. They have a paid version and a free version. The free version pretty much has built out up to the useful molecule stage. So they've built, they've built your form elements. They've got an icon library. They've got um, color swatches so you can do uh, your typography, your color swatching, so everything that would be in a style guide. Um, they also have buttons. Uh, form elements, but not much beyond that. Their paid version has some of the more complete components like cards, accordions, drop downs, um, some of those design features that you may use. Now, I will say um, with design uh, kits that are available that have been contributed, uh, some, of, some of them are have better implementations than others. So, um, and then also the design system components can have opinionated implementations. So if you are analyzing a design kit and maybe you like parts of it but you don't like other parts, then you may either want to continue searching or just recognize that you're not going to use the full design kit and then you can use it as a starting point to build your own. Uh, some of the design systems that I've looked at that have had components that have a lot of variants associated with them are a little, in my opinion, a little bit over-engineered. Some of those components, and what what I have seen is that when I've when I've encouraged designers to use those kits, they have to spend so much time trying to figure out how to configure the component that they typically will just trash it and do their own. So, if you know if the component's not going to be used by the by the audience that it's intended to be used by, then you've probably not built the right type of component. So that's where when I say they're over-engineered, that's where uh, where I'm going with that. I think some of those uh, design kits, they're, they're phenomenal design kits, but with those over-engineered components, they probably would have better served their audiences if they had taken those components and made multiple components out of them that had fewer configuration options, and then a designer could visually pick from the, the components that they wanted, and then they just have minor configuration on those components. A lot higher likelihood that those components are going to be used and not just trashed and, and have a designer build their own. Uh, most of the design uh, systems with components that have variants have not yet been updated to take advantage of some of the new features that were introduced at Config 2023. So if you are uh, looking at considering uh, maybe using a design system as a starter kit for building your own system or using it as a starter kit for building designs for clients, you may want to reach out and just contact the, the um, maintainer and ask are they planning to update to add new features? And if so, when do they anticipate releasing a new version of their design kit before you spend the money to buy one? Because a lot of these that have the components already built out um, are, are typically pay to play. You have to, you have to buy a license in order to use it. And the license is typically, they're fairly reasonable. Uh, the most expensive one I think I've seen is run about $300. They usually average about $100, but there's $100 worth of savings in some of the works that, that's there if you like the approach that they took with building out their components. Um, for purists that would like to build their own design system, um, there's a company out there called UI Collective that has, um, they are a design firm, but they have also released a series of videos and also had a master class that they would, um, they would offer and do training for uh, how to build and construct design systems and how to manage, manage workflows with design systems. As soon as Config 2023 rolled out, they pulled all of their master class and, and online uh, training resources off the web, and they're redoing them. They're redoing them to incorporate all of the new features that Figma has incorporated. So they're, they're rebuilding all of their, they're doing all of their instructional videos to, to leverage um, the variables and modes and uh, the prototyping with, um, with variables and, and dynamic variables and um, all the new features of auto layout. So um, they are releasing on a daily basis two and three new instructional videos on how to build a button, how to build a form element, and use all of the, the new features that were introduced at Config 2023. So they're rapidly getting their resources back online. They are good resources. 
Um, they're, they're typically broken down in focus on a particular area. They're consumable. I think the longest one, longest tutorial I've seen is probably 20 minutes in length. Most of them are five to 10. So definitely, you know, like a consumable uh, level of information so that you don't suffer from information overload, watching an hour long video on how to build out a form. You can then focus on the elements and, and consume and go away and think about what you've what you've watched, do hands-on, repeat the videos, kind of get your head wrapped around it before you move on to the next piece. They really have done an excellent job with those. Um, and if you follow their, I'm actually following their instructional video to build out a design system to see if I want to make a switch at our organization to a design system that we have built from scratch ourselves versus one we currently are using, one that we purchased. So here's some links to the resources, and I will. These slides have been shared or will be shared. I've sent them to the to the conference uh, organizers, so they will be up on. Uh, I think they're putting them on the conference website. So you'll all of these embedded links uh, should work, um, and you can go to um, to any of them to look at more uh, design resources. The first two, Figma's Design System Publications website. They publish blogs and videos and updates on, the, on that website, very, very useful and informative information. In addition to all of the online tutorials that they publish, they have so much stuff though that sometimes you get lost in the sea of videos and you're trying to find and hone down um, and, and find exactly what you're looking for and it can be a little bit daunting. Their, uh, but their uh, design systems website is a great resource to kind of help you focus in on, on a particular subject. Uh, on that design systems uh, re resource uh, website, there's also a list of open design systems that have been contributed to the community that they recommend. These are some of the higher quality design systems that have been contributed. Um, this includes the ones from AWS, it includes the ones from Salesforce, uh, it includes the ones from JIRA. I think there's about 25 of them on there. And so these are design systems that they have curated and have said, yes, these are quality. We're going to put these on our website so that people can easily find them if they want to use them. Um, this right here is the design system that we purchased at my organization. Uh, it is Ship Faster UI. It's by a, a company called Designership. This is a, the, the guy that does this. Is a, uh, he's a designer in Australia. And he also has an online um, YouTube channel. I, wa I got involved with this and basically recommended this after I found his YouTube channel and was watching some of his YouTube videos. And then he said, I have this master class. So I went and took his master class and he talks about uh, ship faster in his master class and uses it for some of the examples. And so I started looking at that and it was, it is a well done design system. It's one of those design systems though that after you get acquiring it and using it, it has some of those over engineered components in it, but still a useful tool nonetheless. So here's some information about the YouTube channels that I was talking about. So there's a, there's a link to Figma's YouTube channel. Um, here are some links specifically to uh, the three videos that I had in the presentation. I just played snippets of those videos. Those videos are actually, most of them are much longer. I just played particular sections. Uh, Michael Wong's YouTube channel, this is the guy that did uh, the Ship Faster UI uh, design kit. So there's a, there's a link to his YouTube channel. And then UI Collective's free online fundamentals training. That's the videos that they're putting up online, you know, two and three a day. Uh, currently to replace the previous resources that they had. Um, so here's a link to their uh, fundamentals training website. Just have to sign up for a free account. It's at no cost and they, they have committed to, to maintaining and making those materials available at no cost. And they are well done. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Like when you generate code with this, like is it that, or what it, is it like clever enough to kind of like know that okay, this is like another component I'm pulling in to kind of break those out into like separate uh, two components? Some of the plugins will do that. In fact, all of them that I have played with will do that. So what you can do is you may have a frame that is a that is a page, but within that frame are frames that represent the components that 
that you 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 right. basically put in to construct that page. So if I wanted to code generate, say, a card that's in the center of the page, I can select the frame for that card, and I can see the code generation just for that card. So yes, if you were like trying to generate code for a React component and you wanted to turn that card into a React component, you could get React starter uh, code for just that component. Or you could click the outer frame and get the entire page. Other questions? how you use Figma question. Um, when you're using some of these design starter kits, do you tend to leave them separate from your current project in the library, or do you pull components in as you need them to your own project, or how do you deal with Figma has a feature, and, and this feature is really available on the paid plans. So, um, so even if you're an individual designer and you've just got the one seat license, so you've got the pro version, uh, you still have uh, the ability to do this. So with a design system that has features in it called components, so you can take a, you can build out a feature and you can say, this is reusable, I'm gonna make this a component. And you can turn it into a component and you can create different variations of it and you can add properties to it. And it's one of those things that you can then put a component instance in your design, configure it with the properties and, and change the look and feel of the component. Um, those items can be published in what's called a components library. And so when you publish a components library, those components are available to you to use as you see fit in multiple designs for clients. So you don't have to copy paste them. You can just select them from a component library. They'll, they'll, if you publish it, they'll be in a drop down. So when you set up your new project, you can say, I want to use this component library, this component library, and this component library in these designs. And then all of the components in those libraries will be available in a drop down, and you can just select the component you want, and a component instance will be put in your designs. The component itself will actually live in your library. So, if you need to do a lot of editing on those existing components, not, not the instance, the actual components, do you bring them into your project, or do you still just leave them in the library and then deal with the syncing? It depends. If it is a component that I want to uh, have available and I want to have control over the main component so that I can reuse it in multiple places, say I want to take that component and apply the color scheme for the particular designs that I'm, that I'm working on, then I will copy that component wholly as it is from the library and put it in my, in my um, design file and it becomes a local component. And then I'll use the, I'll make the modifications to the component as I see fit, and then I'll use the local, it's still available in the drop-down components list, mm -hmm. but I'll use the local component instead of the one that's in the design system. Any other questions? Comments, feedback? No? Well, it is 10 minutes till five. So I am going to push the record stop button.